All right, let's get things started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Travel Geeks with National Geographic Traveller. My name is Farida Zainalova, and I'm project editor here at NGT, and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening. Now, as we all know, we are here to talk about all things Malaysia, whether it's the food, the beaches, the cities, the wildness and the adventure, we're going to try and cover as much of the country as we can tonight. Now, before I introduce you to our wonderful panel of experts, I just want to run through a couple of housekeeping things with you. For those of you who are new to Travel Geeks, here's how the next hour is going to unfold. For the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to quiz the panel uh, with my questions. And towards the end, you guys will have the opportunity to ask them anything that you might think of along the way. Now, the best way to do that is to use the Q&A function. It's just at the bottom of the Zoom window. And I will try and get through as many of those towards the end as I can. We also have the chat function, which is right next to the Q&A button. And in there, feel free to chat amongst yourselves while I talk to the panel. Maybe you've been to Malaysia several times and you want to share your tips and experiences. Maybe you've never been before and you want to ask for some advice. We also have a couple of members of the National Geographic Traveler team in the chat, so they'll be there to answer any of your questions. We also have a pretty fantastic competition tonight where we will be giving away lots of great prizes, including 10 Malaysia Airlines goodie bags, two £100 vouchers to Mango Tree in London, as well as tickets to the National Geographic Traveller Food Festival next July. How do you enter? Well, look out for a survey link that my colleague Angelique is going to post in the chat. And if you complete that survey, then you'll be in within a chance of winning one of those wonderful prizes. Now, without further ado, let's meet our panel. First up, we have our very own Charlotte Wigram Evans. Hi, Charlotte. She's Hi, actually everyone. in the next room. Charlotte is a writer and editor here at National Geographic Traveller. She covers destinations near and far and has a particular passion for nature, wildlife and adventure. When she's not in the office, you can find her sipping rice wine with the Iban tribe in the jungles of Borneo or searching for Bengal tigers in India's untamed wilderness. Next up, we have Matt. Hi, Matt. Hello. Hello. Matt is a Malaysia-based assignment photographer. From 2014 to 2015, Matt was the still photographer for the Channel 4 drama series Indian Summers. His images have appeared in National Geographic Traveller, Condé Nast Traveller, Asian Geographic and many others. Matt is also a photo workshop leader teaching various levels of travel related photography storytelling and a Fujifilm X photographer brand ambassador for Malaysia. It's good to have you Matt. Thank you, good to be here. Next up, we have Laura Holt. Hi, Laura. Laura Hello. is a freelance travel journalist who specializes in wildlife and adventure travel. She was previously part of the award-winning travel team at The Independent and is now the senior commissioning editor at Culture Trip. When she's not trawling the world's markets for the latest street food, you can find her hanging out with orangutans in the jungles of Borneo, prowling for pumas in deepest, darkest Patagonia, and ticking off the big five in Botswana's Okavanga Delta. And last but certainly not least, we have Ollie Horn. Ollie is a globe trotting stand up comedian, presenter, and food expert who hosts the My Signature Dish podcast, where he interviews talented home cooks on their kitchen secrets. He spent 18 months living in Malaysia during the pandemic after initially getting stuck there. We'll be talking more about that later. Uh, and presented Malaysia's first ever Startup Weekend Future of Food event, helped bring thought for food to Kuala Lumpur, and even helped open a pizzeria in a comedy club. And that is our panel. Welcome, everyone. It's so good to see you all here. I'm going to dive straight into my first question, and this one goes out to all of you. What I want to know is, what does Malaysia mean to you? What is your personal relationship connection to Malaysia? Charlotte, let's start with you. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, as you said, obviously, Malaysia is so many things to so many people from, you know, beaches to cities. But for me, 
personally, I would say that it means wilderness, it means adventure. I've been lucky enough to spend quite a bit of time in Sarawak um, in the jungles and just to give a, people a little bit of geographical kind of background, if you don't know Malaysia too well. So Sarawak is Malaysia's largest state. Um, it's on the island of Borneo and it's enormous. It's almost the same size as Malaysia itself. And it's just home to, you know, virgin rainforest. We're talking kind of 75 million years older than the Amazon in parts. And I have, yeah, that's where I am at one of my most happiest, I would say, out in the jungles of Malaysia. So to me, it sort of speaks to, speaks to your inner explorer. Fantastic. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, Matt, let's go to you. You are normally based in Malaysia, so you right. probably have a different uh, relationship with the country than, than we do. Yeah. Um, what is your personal connection to Malaysia? Well, I think for me, Malaysia is home. I mean, it's, it's literally, I mean, I've lived there now for going on 14 years. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, I raised my daughter there. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we just have all of our friends there and, uh, and then it's the, the people, um, I love the diversity of culture, uh, cause I, I'm basically, I'm a, a, a cultural photographer. It's what I do. And, and so <laughs> that you go out your door and you you've got Chinese to shoot and I'm by Chinese I mean culture Chinese culture to shoot you've got Indian culture to shoot you've got Malay culture to shoot you've got um, any other kind of culture as well all these expats that live there and it's just a it's a incredibly um, opening um, uh, welcoming and um, and just a, a relaxing place to live and um, and very safe and and it's the place like i said it, that we've raised a family so um but it, as far as photography and stuff i mean mm -hmm. my i love shooting malaysia because you've got every other week seems like there's another festival or something and they're always very visual so it's a it's a fantastic place to to live and work out of absolutely i'm going to uh quiz you a little bit more later on about what makes the country such a brilliant place to be a photographer but we'll come back to that okay um how about you ollie tell us a little bit about what malaysia means to you yeah well, i'll definitely echo a lot of what matt said that i think mm. as a as a tourist malaysia feels like uh exploring asia on cheat mode because you can cut you can kind of cover a lot in a very small area you, you literally can be sat in one place in a food court and have really great authentic Indian food next to really great authentic Chinese food next to really great authentic Malay food. Uh, and, and that's also represented in the diversity of experiences. If you want a, a Singapore style shopping mall experience, you've got it. But if you want to have a, you know, deepest jungle hike and, you know, well, props to you, Charlotte and Laura, that's not for me, um, then, you know, you can go do that if you, if you want to. Um, and certainly from the perspective of a stand up comedian, I've spent a lot of my career traveling and performing to different audiences. I've never experienced an audience like you get in Malaysia, where you literally will have uh, ladies wearing full religious dress, uh, drinking cups of tea next to a table of Australian backpackers that have drunk the bar dry. And <laughs> they're, on, they're on tables next to each other with some, you know, Indian, culturally Indian people that are taking the mick out of the culturally Chinese people. And th there's this incredible sense of, just like Matt said, of, of, of belonging. Uh, where people from all, all very, very different cultures share one Malaysian identity. And I, in all my travels, I've never found a country quite like that. I love that. So beautifully said. Last but not least, Laura, what about you? Uh, so I am a travel journalist and as kind of my main motivation for traveling has been heading uh, south of the equator in search of wilderness and wildlife. And for me, uh, Borneo or Malaysia at large uh, kind of ticks all those boxes for me. Um, you know, it, it speaks to adventure, it's tangled jungles, it's getting away from everything uh, that we, you know, find so familiar at home. Uh, you know, and just some of the wildlife experiences I've had there have been uh, kind of unparalleled and anywhere else I've been. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. All well said. Um, my next question, and this is uh, one that I'm really interested to in know what you guys have to say, and that is um, for someone who has never been to Malaysia, they're a first timer, and they might be a little bit overwhelmed trying to plan their first trip. 
where are the destinations and the experience and what are the experiences on a first timers itinerary for Malaysia? Where shouldn't they miss? Um, Laura, let's let's start with you. So I personally haven't been to uh, the peninsula, Malaysia, I haven't been to Kuala Lumpur, Penang, or even Langkawi, which is the kind of honeymooners favorite island off the coast. So that's almost kind of one or two trips in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I mean, Borneo is wild, but it's very accessible. Uh, so there are two main Malaysian states in Borneo, Sabah and Sarawak, and, uh, a lot of first timers maybe go to Sabah first and spend the duration of their trip there uh, because you kind of access it by Kota Kilabalu. Uh, but I would kind of urge people to go further south into Sarawak. Uh, I think that's kind of not to be missed. If you can spare an extra week or five days to go there, that's where the kind of real tribal culture is kind of really rich. Mm. The food, it gets really interesting. Uh, and the wildlife is amazing there too. So yeah, I would urge people to kind of uh, add that on to their itinerary. Fantastic. Charlotte, I saw you nodding along there when Laura was talking. I feel like you agree. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with Laura on that one. I mean, I think both of us have spent a little bit of time in Kuching, which is the capital of Sarawak. And it's kind of down in the south. And from there, as Laura was saying, it's, it's just re it's really easy to access the jungle but when you are in the jungle you feel a million miles away from civilization mm. and the Yiban I think it's about about 150 kilometers from Kuching you know you get these boats kind of out into the jungle you're staying with them just next door to kind of their long house where they live and they'll take you out into the jungle with you and you can spot orangutans as well which I just think is everyone who goes to Malaysia has to go and look for orangutans yeah Absolutely. Um, Matt, you live in Penang. What what would be your kind of if you, you know, were a first time visitor? My, my take on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I mean, I, I've I have been to uh, Sabah. I haven't been to um, Sarawak, but um, but I, I, I love Sabah. I absolutely love it. Um, and uh, some of the best diving in the world. Uh, I mean, in the world is is right there. Some live reefs. Um, you don't see a lot of live reefs anymore, and uh, they have uh, live reefs there. And but I think that if but yeah, I mean, for for me, um, I would almost try to to plan my my trip around one of the many many holidays uh, or festivals that are coming up. Like in usually in January February, there's Taipusam which is a, an Indian festival where the uh, devotees will pierce their bodies with these uh, long uh, needle-like things. And they carry these uh, kavalis, these, um, these big uh, racks of, of, uh, of feathers and, and all kinds of stuff. And they, and they dance and it's really loud, very visual, very bright, or uh, in like in, uh, in the spring, uh, fall, you've got uh, Hungry Ghost Festival, where there's just, again, it's all just incredibly um, uh, just it, full of colors and, and tradition is so rich. They, they, uh, it's an, it, that, that one's a Chinese festival. So there's, there's all kinds of, of festivals, almost, almost literally every month. And so you could, I, I guess what I would say is, if you're coming in the first time, and you, you know, you're going to go to some place, um, try to find out if your trip works in, in conjunction with one of these festivals. And then, and okay. then, because one of the things I've found is that during the festival, especially, uh, Malaysians, uh, they, they just seem to not care if you're photographing and things like this. And, uh, it's a, it's a really a, a, a great time. Okay. I would say I'll say you need to get to Penang for the food, and um, mm. that's a that's a that's like the, okay. the the foodie hotspot. So fantastic, Matt! I can see that somebody has messaged you saying that they've been to Malaysia, but not for photography purposes, and they think that you should do a workshop. But you do, right? I do workshops, uh, not yeah? so often in uh, in Malaysia. I do workshops okay. in uh, I do a lot of workshops in India. Um, okay. because I also lived in India for 13 years, but, um, but we have done, we've done, we've okay. done some in Malaysia, so we, we can work that out. 
Okay, maybe they can keep an eye out on your uh, sure, socials. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay, fantastic. And um, we've mentioned some of the, the most popular places, Penang, uh, Langkawi, Sarawak. But in terms of the unsung heroes of Malaysia, um, it might be, you know, a little bit too soon to be talking about this because we have we're so much ground to cover. But if someone's already been once or twice and they're here tonight to find out about the off the beaten path places, um, where would they be for you guys? Laura, where is your little secret um, that's almost, you know, you don't want to talk about it, but you must. But I will. <laughs> uh, one of my definite favourite places um, is a place called Batang Ai, and that's accessible, and I say accessible, <laughs> from Kuching because it takes five hours by road to get there. Then you get to the edge of a reservoir, the Batang Ai Reservoir, and you head upriver with the Iban tribe in uh, longboats, which uh, formerly were kind of unmotorized. They now have little motors on the back. And you putter up this gigantic river, often against the tide. You often have to get out. The guides, the Iban tribe kind of push it up the river or are kind of moving the boats up. And it's a real adventure. That, that part uh, kind of took five hours for me one time. Uh, and when you get there, you stay at a place called Nanga Sumpa, uh, which is a traditional long uh, house, which is kind of how the Iban tribe or a lot of tribal communities in Borneo live. Uh, and you stay with them in the middle of the jungle and you're kept awake by the kind of cacophony of the jungle and you know chickens uh, and roosters uh, crowing at all hours. Uh, and you really kind of get a handle on what it's like to live there in the middle of nowhere. Your phones don't work. Uh, there are hiking trails all around. And, uh, you know, the wildlife is amazing around there. It's hard for the wildlife. Uh, you have to really look for it and you have to be kind of prepared uh, for it to emerge at any moment, at the least expected moment. But uh, definitely, I would say, you know, that's almost kind of takes three days by the time you travel from Kuching uh, to get there, but it's really worth the extra effort. Okay. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I'd love to do that. And that's Ollie, you, you stayed uh, in Malaysia during the pandemic for a good year yeah, and a yeah. half. Um, was there anywhere you, you, maybe you gigged somewhere that you, you don't think people know about? What is your favorite unsung hero of the country? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that you can get a lot of what Laura got the kind of phone signal doesn't work, you're out in nature, um, but without having to rely on the goodwill of a local tribe to push you for five hours. <laughs> um, like, because of the travel restrictions in, in Kuala Lumpur during the pandemic, when Malaysia had a generally very good response in the early months of the pandemic and stopped interstate travel. So I had to look within the state and I, and I found, you know, you, you can drive for an hour, 90 minutes as far down as, um, but between KL and Malacca, you've got an area where Port Dixon is at the south. I think it's called Sembilan, maybe I've pronounced that wrong. But all mm. around there, there are just dozens and dozens and dozens of nature reserves, which are accessible by car, um, which is a lot easier than like persuading someone to lend you their dinghy or whatever Laura did. Um, <laughs> and it's very affordable. They're all, the, the eco and sustainability practices are there built in. You know, it's not, it's not there as a marketing ploy. Um, and right. you can have that, you know, total switching off piece, you know, you're staying in, in nice accommodation, that is to say it's huts, but you know, it's, it's primitive, you know, there isn't air conditioning and there isn't, uh, you know, like I lost my key, but it wasn't a problem because I could climb in through my own shower. So like, you know, that's like, it's, it's that kind of setup, but it's really good fun. Um, and also I would say something which I think a traveler from Europe should take to Malaysia is we're quite used, particularly in the UK, I think, to doing quick city breaks in Spain and doing a walking tour of Barcelona in the morning and then, you know, quick, quick dinner and then, you know, watching a concert at night. That doesn't really work in Malaysia. It's just, it's, it's, it's a okay. different pace. And so I would say not cramming lots of things into your day, but allowing yourself to, to kind of just get absorbed in the pace uh, is really worth doing. So I'd say spend time in KL, but just move slightly out of the center. Go to one of the, the, the districts outside. I spent a lot of time in Taman Tundoktes Mile, TTDI, which is just north of, of where the, um, the, the towers are. And there, you know, it, it, it felt like a different city. It was a lot more mm. slower pace of life. Um, the food slightly changed depending on which, which communities were, were more prevalent there. 
Uh, and of course, you go to these smaller communities and people are just super excited to see you there and persuade you where the best faculty is, where the best Char Siu is. You know, they're convinced that it's better than the one which is uh, next door. So I think there's a lot to be said for, particularly a first time traveler. Um, don't think of KL as just the airport that you need to escape from. Within an hour, you are in the jungle. I mean, KL is literally built yeah. in a jungle, right? Okay. And do you know what? I'm going to ask you a little bit more about um, uh, KL later. I know that you're an advocate for the capital. Um, so we will come back to that. Um, Charlotte, what about you? What What would you say as the kind of the unsung? So part? I would, I mean, agree with Laura absolutely wholeheartedly, 100%. Batang Eye is incredible. Yeah. But if you want to go a little bit further further afield, I would say fly from Batangai up to Miri, which is Sarawak's second city. And from there you have, I mean, you have four national parks on your doorstep, but among them are two Mulu, which have, I don't know if people have seen pictures, it's quite an iconic image from Sarawak. It's this dense sort of blanket of jungle and through the jungle are these enormous granite spears that are kind of, you know, they're sort of protruding from the jungle like knives. And it's absolutely, spellbounding you know you can hike to the top and then view sort of stretch out over kind of uninterrupted jungle and then you also beneath the earth um you've got cave systems i think it's the world's largest cave chamber called sarawak chamber easy to remember wow. and you can fit 40 jumbo jets in there it's, it's that's just trying to give people a scale of how big it is it's absolutely enormous and it's just yeah, it's just an incredible experience. You've also got Nia Caves, I think the oldest human um, remains in Southeast Asia were found there, I think maybe 40,000-ish years ago. And that's also incredible. You can also see there the, um, the changing of the guard, I think it's called, where bats will leave the cave at sundown as um, the swiftlets return to, to their nests inside the cave. And it's an incredible experience. You're kind of surrounded by this enormous black cloud um as as wow. the swiftlets are coming in and the bats going out so yeah you've got 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 an amazing nature experience there as well gosh that sounds incredible matt i saw you nodding along was there anything well just the, you wanted to add to that? she was talking about the the, the oldest like the, mm. the cave paintings and stuff and mm. that that is actually so I teach some stuff on visual storytelling. And that is what I like to refer to people as the very first visual story, because it is the oldest um, like pictograph uh, on, a, on a wall, I think in the world. And- How is it um, in the world? Uh, oh, I was doing it a disservice. <laughs> yeah. So it's, That's I mean, it, it, it's the ones with the hands, right? You're talking about the ones yeah. with the hands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and in some ways it's the- Going into the afterlife and yeah, it, it's, it's yeah. astonishing. And the hands, if you think about it, that's kind of the very first selfie, you know, because they, they put <laughs> their own hand up there point. and they put their yeah. own hand up there and then they, they would blow, they think that they blew, you know, the paint around it because it's a silhouette of the hand. And uh, yeah, so yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah. Hey, but my out of the way place that I would say, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's more for if you want less adventure and more chilling and relaxing on the beach. Um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. I'm, and I, again, I'm not saying it's not a good place to go, but I'm not, Lankau is not my favorite place. I go to one of the Perhentian islands, which is on the, the East coast. There's uh, Kachil and Basar, which is the big and little island. And um, uh, especially the uh, Besar, yeah, that's a, I think that's a picture of it down there that she ah, put up. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, the water is awesome. incredible. There's some, um, it's decent diving. It's not the best diving in Malaysia. That's definitely down in, in Simporna, uh, down in, uh, yeah. And, but, uh, but it, the beaches are just incredibly powder white, just, just lovely beaches and, and, um nobody there i mean it's it's like this little forgotten place and it's great it's great so oh sounds like heaven on earth um i need to weave in a few practical questions here as well and i want to talk about getting around the country um if i'm planning a trip um regardless of where in the country it is should i hire a car and do it by myself or is malaysia really easy to kind of explore using public transport ollie you're nodding what do you think 
Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I didn't have a car and I, I, I availed myself of, of, of the buses. There's a lot of really good long distance buses that you, you can take. Um, certainly from KL, you can go down to Penang. It's a one hour flight. I recommend taking the flight there, but the train back, because you'll be so full, you might need an extension belt. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and also I'd say something that you probably shouldn't plan to do, particularly if you're in KL, is walk a lot, partly because it's just, it's insanely hot, but also the, the city center of KL is not really designed much for, for, for pedestrians. Um, and, and you can always tell a tourist because they're kind of walking around lost like lemmings, like stuck in a video game. Um, so, so generally, you know, public transport in Malaysia is very, very good. Um, but the centre of KL is not really a walking city. You need to avail yourself of buses. But like I said earlier, you know, literally an hour's drive, you can be at the beach, you can be in the middle of a rainforest and it's very affordable to, to hire a car. So I think you should, but you shouldn't plan all of your travel around around having a car for, for 10 days necessarily. Yeah, but Absolutely. if you're, if, but let me just jump in here because especially, um, you know, I'm talking as an American, especially you Brits who drive on the same side of the road as the Malaysians, um, you know, hiring, the, the roads are some of the best around. Mm. I mean, they're, they're the uh -huh. highways are, they're, I mean, they're, they're as good as anywhere, um, the yeah. highways are there. And, Apart and from so- Apart City Center. Chaos City Center looks like the person who designed it was inspired by a bowl of curly fries. Like sometimes <laughs> I could not make head nor tail of, of, of where to head. But yeah, outside That's the city way. center. I'm not right. sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but the beauty is that you can stop along the way and you can right. avail yourself of local life, you know, and and you know, you see a waterfall, you can pull over and see the water. I mean, because there's, there's waterfalls everywhere in this in this country. Um and um, but yeah. Um, but I, I would say either hire a car. I mean, cause we live there, so we owned a car, uh, and, right. uh, but, uh, but buses and, 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 but I do agree with Ali fly to, if you're going from KL up to, up to Penang fly, cause it's, it's super cheap and, um, and you, you're going to be full when you leave. So. Although that said, the, the travel by train is quite fun because you need to take a boat as well. So you can, you know, that, that, that's a day's adventure in itself. I'd kind of say, uh, it, contrary to what these guys have been saying, in, in Borneo, I would not advise uh, probably driving by car. Just because of the kind of topography, it's so densely knitted. If you get flights over, uh, you know, you fly over these massive mountains and tangle forests and you think, God, I'm glad I didn't drive over that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is actually quite useful to kind of have a tour up there, I'd say, in Borneo, because mm -hmm. it's so um, far everywhere, so kind of spread out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these places have only, you know, that they've only had roads kind of that have gone to them in the last, you know, decade, 15 years. So and when we when I, I say roads in a loose, loose sense yeah. of the term. So, I, I, I have a friend who is a, I have a friend who is a comedian from Sabah, and he tells a joke about how they got their first road. But he said, but we only built one. So if two cars need to pass, we just get out and swap drivers in reverse. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Guys, as we're talking, my colleague Angelique is posting some really useful links um, on the Malaysia Tourism website, as well as um, some editorial coverage that we've done over at National Geographic as well. So everyone at home, do make sure to, maybe don't read them now, favorite them and then read them at 8 p.m. Mm. Um, I want to talk about animals because this wouldn't be a conversation about Malaysia without the animals. Um, I want to know about some of your favorite animal encounters in the country. Um, uh -huh. Charlotte, I know you well and I know that you are you adore animals in general. Tell me a little bit about your experiences. So I feel like when we talk about Malaysia, we and I know we've touched on it slightly earlier, um, but you've got to talk about orangutans. I mean, you can't go to Malaysia, you can't go to Borneo and not go and look for orangutans. And I'm sure that Laura can agree with, yeah, will agree with me and probably share her own orangutan stories afterwards. But I would say you kind of want, if you're going to Borneo for the first time, a near guaranteed sighting. I don't want to say a guaranteed sighting, but near guaranteed. And if you go mm. to Kuching, about an hour away, um, really close is a nature reserve called Semengo. Um, where they rehabilitate orangutans who have perhaps been in captivity or have been illegally traded. Um, and I think, I think the numbers change a little bit, but there are about 30. 
And the last time I've been there a few times because every time I'm in Borneo, I'm, I'm like, get me to Semengo. And the last time I was there, we were waiting for about 20 minutes and there was no sign, you know, during the fruiting season, they don't always come as a platform sort of in amongst the trees. It still feels very wild, but there's a platform where the um, volunteers at Semengo, they leave out fruit uh, in the jungle. And if it's fruiting season, the orangutans may not come, but, and this was, this was fruiting season. So I was waiting, waiting, waiting. And then this enormous, male orangutan and I, I really was blown away by the size of this guy I mean I think male <laughs> orangutans can get up to about 90 pounds and I'm actually surprised he didn't weigh more he was you know he dwarfed the the people um who I was around we we're you're maybe a kind of 30 meters away from this platform and you know mm. huge cheek pads which they uh get in sort of kind of adolescence to attract females um yeah I mean it's, it's an interesting look, uh, but yeah, and you know, like a massive sort of shaggy fur on their backs, which I also wasn't expecting. And I think, I mean, orangutans are the heaviest animals that live in trees. And honestly, when I when I saw him, I I was surprised that a tree could take his weight. He was he was enormous. <laughs> and yeah, it was it was. Oh, oh, him. Him. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, you're smiling. Have you had a similar experience to Charlotte with the giant orangutans? I've had many. <laughs> I've had lots of different experiences, never at the times that I thought I was going to see them. And often, uh, when I've been a Borneo, I've often felt that the kind of animals are sort of colluding against me. And everywhere I try and go, and specifically to spot them, they sort of go in the other direction. And then when I'm not paying attention, they kind of pop up at the least expected moments. Uh, so, I did a thing called the Red Ape Trail, again in Batangai, which is the place I mentioned earlier. That, it used to be a 10 day trek and it's in the deepest, the furthest part of that jungle region. They've kind of, a, a company called Borneo Adventure, who's a local tour op, uh, kind of made it more accessible, reduced it to five days. But it's still uh, very intrepid. Uh, you're kind of hiking through dense jungle and climbing up uh, banks, uh, all in the pursuit, hopefully, of seeing red apes, of seeing orangutans. Did I see them? No. <laughs> oh, no. But, so you're sleeping in the jungle under mosquito nets, you're getting, you know, still bitten alive, you're sweating and toiling to see these uh, orangutans. I didn't see any. On the boat back, I'm riding down uh, the river, absolutely spent, lie back thinking, oh God, the dream's <laughs> over. What do I see? <laughs> An orangutan suddenly pops up on the river edge a mother and a baby uh, just kind of looking down at me like, you idiot, where have you been? <laughs> uh, and similarly in another place, in uh, a place called Gomantong Caves, where I kind of went into these caves and it was an added extra on the tour I was doing. And I wasn't particularly bothered about going, if I'm completely honest, uh, <laughs> because these caves are sort of covered with thousands of cave dwelling insects. Uh, and bats and swiftlets, as Charlotte was talking about earlier. And so I was walking out of the dark, out of this dark cave, sort of wiping the bat guano off me, uh, sort of recovering from that experience. And again, it's kind of a very uh, managed area that those caves, uh, you know, there are pathways mm -hmm. and viewing platforms. And suddenly out of nowhere, I kind of look up and again, a mother orangutan and two babies are in the trees above us, sort of just looking down, kind of chucking fruit pips down on my head. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so they're all, amazing. all right there, you've just got to be ready. <laughs> yeah, Laura, someone just said that's such an amazing story. <laughs> yeah. comments. They're all and laughing at me. <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to say this, but we have 10 minutes before I have to open up the questions to the audience. So. Matt, I want to go to you next um, because Wait, but I, I got to tell you my favorite animal story, though. Oh, sure. Real quick. Oh, sure. Real quick. Yes, go on. Yes, please okay. do. Please do. Go uh, on. So, so living there, my wife and I run in the mornings and uh, it was about five, five thirty in the morning. We, we were parking our, our car at the Tesco parking lot to take a run from there. And I noticed this long, long, shiny, look like a line across two parking uh, spaces. And as I got closer and closer, I realized it was a python and in the Tesco parking lot in downtown Penang. And, um, and so uh, I okay. thought, oh my goodness, we, you know, I'm, I was so afraid someone was gonna run over it. So we got, a, we got a trash bin and put it down and literally kind of 
touched its tail and and had it go in there and then we re, we took it up in the mountains and released it but uh, but that's what i'm saying malaysia is is it is a wild and wonderful place where you can find anything on any time so and so yes. anyway i ha i had the same experience with the python but i uh, ran in the other direction <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wouldn't class that as my favorite animal encounter yeah. Yeah. I'm with Laura right. on this one. Um, Matt, I'm going to very quickly come back to you because um, at National Geographic Traveller, um, a lot of our readers are uh, budding photographers, established photographers. Um, if somebody even wants you to have a regular workshop in Malaysia. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, what makes Malaysia uh, such a fantastic place to be a photographer? And what is, you talked a little bit about this earlier with the festivals, but... Mm -hmm. What is your favorite subject to shoot? And what's been your favorite assignment, would you say? Well, I think my favorite subject to shoot in Malaysia is really, um, in, in, a, in a broad sense, is the festivals, which I talked about. Um, I, um, I, I think I've shot Thai Pusam Festival, this Hindu festival at the beginning of the year. I don't know. Um, few almost a dozen times i've shot um the hungry ghost and uh other festivals um uh nine emperors which is a fantastic festival um they're just they're, the festivals usually number one are only uh i mean they're not like like fourth of july in the u.s it's a day that's it right. now we prepare for it for a month or something but it's a day these festivals are like a week long uh, and, and so you, you get to be able to just immerse yourself into it. And the people are very willing. Uh, I love photographing people. Uh, mm -hmm. I love faces and Malaysian people, uh, whether they're Malay, Chinese, or Indian, they're, they're always, uh, very open, especially during the festivals to have their photos made. Um, mm -hmm. and so I, I enjoy that. I enjoy just doing sort of street photography, walking through the streets of, uh, old town, uh, in like in Georgetown in Penang or in, uh, in KL looking for one of the older parts of the city and just walking with a camera in hand, talking to people, getting to know them, and then just saying, can I take your picture? Oh, and that's the other thing is that everybody speaks English. Well, not everybody, but okay. you feel like that's everybody sick. speaks English. Um, right. it, it is not hard to get around not knowing Malay, uh, okay. at all. Um, and, uh, you know, you might find a 90 year old man, uh, from the village that doesn't speak English, but, but most people are, are going to be able to speak English. Um, so, Fantastic. Um, yeah. So I just think, I think it, it, it is just a very open and welcoming place for, for photographers and, um, you know, it's all about color and timing and light and the light's great. The color's great. And the timing is, uh, is amazing. I mean, every, every time you turn around, there's a festival. Excellent. Um, to everyone at home, we've just posted a link to Matt's work so you can check out some of his incredible photography oh, um, after tonight. Now we're about to move on to my favorite subject of all time. And that is food. Ollie, I'm looking at you here. I want to yeah, know. I can tell about... my animal story. Oh my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> And if, if you can do it quickly, shoot. Did you eat your animal at the end of it, Ollie? Well, exactly, that's exactly what happened. I mean, that did actually happen. I mean, I, I went to a, um, like a roadside chicken rice place where they grabbed a chicken that was just free roaming and that was the start of the process and it ended up on my plate. I was like, you know, you know why not, you know? <laughs> um, you know, fair enough. Um, but no, I, I mean, every, um, Matt's absolutely right. You can absolutely get by without any English at all. But if you need to learn one word of Bahasa, it's the word makan, uh, which, which means food. Because uh, you'll hear that, you know, every right. a pause in a conversation or a decision to be made is. But first, makan. Okay. And can, Oli, can you tell us a little bit about um, those, the, for those of the, us that might not be familiar with the cuisine of Malaysia? What are the, what are the must try dishes and where are the best places, regions to go for food lovers? Well, I mean, Malaysians will fight about where the best place to get food is. And, you know, people from Penang will say it's Penang and, you know, people from- It is. Will say it's Penang. <laughs> you but, uh, say um, that. My, I mean, my, my take on Malaysian f food is, it's easy to fall in the trap of thinking that it's, ju it's just like the other countries whose cultures are represented. So it's easy, for example, to look at a Chinese restaurant and go, oh yeah, that's 
that's like char siu uh, roasted pork like i would get in hong kong but often it's not or, or like an indian restaurant you go to a banana leaf and go oh that's just like they would have in southern india and it's easy to, to think that you're just kind of getting approximations of different countries food you're not these are you, you know unique malaysian specific versions mm. things that you absolutely must try um, are for the experience going to a mamak so a mamak is it, I mean, Mamak is, is, it's hard to really know what it is. It's basically like a restaurant where um, they've decided to put the kitchen inside. Um, so you, you see the guy that's making the naan bread or the roti Love that. at the table next to you. Um, and there'll be big trays of food, normally different curries, normally Indian food, but, but often some fusion. And the, the point is that, that you, you just kind of keep ordering throughout, throughout the night and sharing and drinks are very cheap and plentiful. Um, so definitely a Mamak. And the nice thing about a Mamak is, uh, you know there kind of is no menu it's kind of you know if you ask for a menu they kind of laugh at you as if to go oh yeah we made one of those like 20 years ago but no one needs it <laughs> you just kind of you know say, say what you like and they you know they they, they bring no, it, to you. it up yeah ex exactly and and also i'd say you know don't underestimate the big chinese and indian communities and, and the food that, that they produce bakute for example um it, it is, is an absolutely delicious very peppery delicious soup Plus, of course, you've got the Malay staples, such as your nasi lemak, which for someone that doesn't like anchovies is a challenge because nasi lemak is a dish where they found five different ways of putting anchovies in stuff. Um, but oh. uh, but, it, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good. If you can get over it and the spicy sambal and the delicious fried chicken, I am goreng, uh, you know. So what I'd say is definitely try all the roadside staples. Um, some of my favorite places to eat are where it doesn't appear on google maps you just have to know that if you walk past a police station take a left there's some bins and there's a guy with a car that once a week will open it up with trays of fish and you know you'll find that those are just as delicious any, as any restaurant you'll ever go to sometimes there's no pricing you just throw a load of food on a plate you don't need to know what it is you take it to some old lady who looks at it and just judges how much you're supposed to pay like she uses ai or something um so <laughs> So I'd say don't don't worry too much about must try dishes. Rather try the must try experiences, which is the the roadside try a bit of everything, the late night mamak, uh, you know, the the early coffee uh, tam style coffee, um, and, and the fruit, and just, the fruit. We haven't mentioned the fruit. Oh, oh yes. I don't know. I don't know. the country. Like the the yeah, yeah, yeah. Durian. Well, that's what I was wondering if you were. Do we have there. thoughts on the durian fruit? So the durian fruit, for anyone who doesn't know, is definitely an acquired taste, or should I say smell. It's um, the preferred fruit uh, of orangutans. And yes, it's interesting. I'm not a fan, but it's to be tried by everyone. There's also rambutan that's kind of a smaller, spiky, tropical fruit. Uh, yeah, and obviously, you know, that's why uh, Malaysia is so rich in wildlife. It's because it's got so many, much uh, fruit. I think Laura is, is underselling how potent the durian is. Yeah. You can smell, <laughs> I mean, it's, you you can smell a durian it. stand from the next street. <laughs> okay, guys, that'll be nice. That's one of my favorite fruits. So, uh, <laughs> is it a quiet taste? <laughs> it is. No, and, and, and and it, durian. it really is an acquired taste. I, I was shooting a story on durian and, and I, I ate one, uh, you know, a, a serving of one, and and it was like, yeah, okay. I mean, it's okay. And then, uh, but doing a story, you know, you end up having more and more and more. And uh, by the end of it, I'm like, hey, this is really good stuff. And now every year, my wife and I just like we really look forward to durian season. So, yeah. I tried durian ice cream, and that was just Ooh. about okay. Possible. And where did you try that, Ollie? I tried that at uh, at some market store in the Genting Highlands. Uh, okay. So I went for a trip up, trip up to the Genting Highlands, and there, there was a night market. And uh, you know, I mean, I thought if I'm gonna if I'm gonna ever like durian, it's gonna start by having it in an ice cream. And you know, okay. I didn't not like it. Yeah, but you Charlotte, know, I, you're durian not cheesecake's good. Durian cheesecake, my goodness, the possibilities are endless. Charlotte, you, um, I know you're not a fan of durian fruit. Um, no, I mean, what I kind of dishes did you have when you were in Malaysia? What are some of your favorites? I did try durian and then avoid it afterwards. I think that there's a reason why it's it's banned in a lot of uh, public places. I mean, the smell, it you can't even really describe the smell. Um, I think, I mean, it's a rite of passage and I would say to everyone, you know, go and try it. 
But other than that, um, I would say that some of my favorite meals, I totally agree with what Ollie and Matt have been saying about that real kind of community spirit that there is around eating. And it's the same. So I spent a bit of time in the Highlands in northeastern Sarawak um, with a tribe called the Kalibit tribe. And their wild boar, so there's a season for, for wild boar, and it was when I was out there, and it's a tradition in their longhouses. You know, you have a wild boar, it's tended to by all of the kind of members of the village. It's seasoned, you know, you really don't need much seasoning on there. It's, it's so incredibly tender. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a local salt spring um, where they use a little bit of salt to sprinkle on, on wild boar. And I had that alongside, I mean, I would say that, you know, up there, it's incredibly remote and sort of necessity is the mother of invention, if you know what I mean. So, I mean, I had flying fox soup. That was, it was good. I wouldn't absolutely rush back to have it again. Um, but catfish curry, um, Adan rice, which um, I don't, I'm, I'm sure that Matt probably knows more living, living out there. So amongst rice aficionados, it's uh, known as being particularly good and it is really nice. It's got a kind of sweet, nutty flavour. Mm. And all that finished off in the with Highlands is really nice. All finished off with two ac wine. Oh yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> Speaking of rice. Ah. It's the local grog, the rice wine, and is, um, yeah, potent. I had a fun night in a longhouse with uh, some locals on a two at wine. Yeah. <laughs> and it changes the flavour. Did you find that, Laura, depending on how it's, how it's brewed, sort of different families brew it in different ways, and it can taste totally different. Yeah, I mean, after a while, I think you just stop tasting it. <laughs> you just sort of lose all, all taste. Brilliant. <laughs> and that is the time to try durian for the first time. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, go. I'm going to try and power through a couple more questions before we open it up to the audience. Um, if you are burning to say something, uh, then please do jump in. Um, I feel like we need to talk a little bit more about Kuala Lumpur. Ollie. You're a big advocate for the capital. Um, if someone is flying into Kuala Lumpur and they want to get to know the city, how long should they spend there? And what are your, let's say, very quick, quick fire top three things that they mustn't miss when they're there? Good. Well, I think what's nice about KL is, is it you, you get you can have the full breadth of experiences. So if you want to do that kind of first night, top of a skyscraper, selfie with an expensive cocktail, with a you know a pool, you can have that kind of luxury, you know, Dubai influencer experience at about a quarter of the price. So like definitely do that, get that out of your system. Um, I would also say don't underestimate that there's nature to see in KL. People forget that KL is built within a rainforest. You've got amazing nature reserves, which are accessible by bus. You've got the, 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 um, the bird park, literally right in the town center. You've got the most insanely beautiful mosques that just are popping up here, there and everywhere. So do your kind of influencer stuff, get that selfie out of the way. Um, and, uh, you know, there are luxury shopping malls that can rival Singapore, whatever else. But I would say, if you are spending longer than a few days in KL, pick a couple of different areas. You know, you go, go and stay in, in one of the Northern districts, stay in, in one of the Southern districts, you could stay in SS2. You'll find the accommodation is cheaper, but still of a, of a similar quality. And you'll, you'll have these full, the full breadth of, um, of late night, like I said, the late night mamak experiences. You'll find the local places where the locals go to get their beef rendang for breakfast, which is the most, in my view, the most delicious way to eat beef uh, ever invented. Um, and, uh, and additionally, I would say, like I said earlier, use KL as your base to pop out to some remote places. Don't just think of it, think of it as your stopover, that you stop over for a couple of days and then leave for somewhere like, you know, Miri or whatever it is. The, the, mm. that you're heading off to. Guys, I'm going to ask you one more question. And um, so sorry to ask this of you, but if you could keep it quite brief. Um, what is the one Malaysian experience thing, person that will stay with you forever? What What is your best memory of Malaysia? In like a couple of lines, I'm so sorry. Uh, who should we go to first? Easy. Matt, I'll, I'll I, I, I can see you. Oh, okay. Yes, shoot. Um, well, mine was the, the, the first time I did a, a set in a Malaysian comedy club all about Malaysian food. Mm. Um, and I will, I will never forget that because a couple of special people that I met were nearby me. Um, and as I said, if you, if you enjoy stand-up comedy, 
try going to a Malaysian comedy club. The Crack House Comedy Club in TTDI is, a, is, is my home club. Um, but seeing an audience getting so riled up about some of the things I was saying about their food, uh, you know, almost to the point where it was, I could have created actual violence if I carried on. Um, that's right. how much the Malaysians love, love their food. Um, and that's, yeah, that's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. Amazing. Matt, I can see you thinking. What are you? Yeah, I am. Because, you know, when you live there, it's it's hard to think of one, you know, one thing. But right. I, I think one of, one of the things that I missed is actually these, um, the food courts, these markets, they're everywhere. And, mm -hmm. and to be able to go in and uh, order my favorite dishes, uh, which uh, Ali didn't mention was char kway chow. Um, and mm -hmm. it's a, a rice noodle dish that's just it's amazing. But, um, but to sit there and just watch life go by uh, and then, um, or, or go early in the morning when all the old men are, are in the market and they're eating and they're eating, uh, this, uh, this white bread toasted over coals and then, um, and then having this local coffee, which is normally, if you really like coffee, you won't like this. So I would refer to it as a coffee drink. You know, it, 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 it's very, mm -hmm. very sugary. It's very, very stout. Um, and, uh, but I, I love it. Um, and, okay. and then, and then half boiled eggs. So I, that's the, I, to me, it's, it's, it's food and people. Amazing. Laura, Charlotte, what about you guys? I would say, as, as I was alluding to earlier, I think many of the wildlife experiences are hard fought and when they kind of come, they're particularly memorable. And aside from the orangutans, in an area we haven't mentioned yet, which is Kinabatang Gang in Sabah, uh, it's a river re region there. And I remember at dusk, because Borneo is equatorial, the night falls really suddenly, quickly. Mm. And we came upon these pygmy elephants sort of uh, feasting on a thicket of bamboo. And as the dust was falling, you could see kind of, um, you know, proboscis monkeys like sort of circling through the trees. And we just kind of watched these pygmy elephants kind of trumpeting and honking at us from the other side of the bamboo. Amazing. Charlotte, very quickly. Oh, but yeah, I'll try and be, I'll try and be quick. Um, it is so, oh, it's so hard. And I would really say people are just, such a huge, huge part of what makes Malaysia so amazing. I mean, as I think Matt and Ollie have both said, their English is incredible. I went out into the jungle with a guide called Johnson and he just couldn't have been, you know, he was sporting this huge um, machete in his belt. He had a cut down one ear from a rattan palm that kind of got him and we went out into the jungle and he was telling me essentially how to survive in the jungle, which was simultaneously amazing and also quite frightening. I was like, please don't leave me. Uh, but he was, you know, he was telling me that spiders in the jungle taste just like crab. Um, and then to sort of prove his point about this sort of assortment of sea life that you can find in the jungle, he then started picking leeches off my ankle and eating them. Um, oh. Which, yeah, yeah, I mean, I just- And you complain he, about he durian? Said, he said they tasted like squid. <laughs> I was, did it taste like squid? I, I didn't I didn't try a leech myself. I okay. Through the line of that, but he's <laughs> that enjoying desperate. them a lot. So. <laughs> oh, incredible! I think that's the right word. <laughs> okay, right. I'm going to fire some questions from the audience, and I think I might just direct this to one person so we get through a couple. Um, when is the best time to visit Matt? As someone who lives there, what would you say is the answer? Well, to considering the weather is pretty much um, hot, wet, and less hot and less wet um it's almost any time uh is good uh i would I, that's a that's a tough one because really it is there isn't any real bad weather in malaysia so um as far as coming like during festival seasons the fest the festivals are all year round so uh i think uh, I, I unfortunately I don't have a, a straight answer for that. I think find what you want to go see and mm -hmm. and make sure that the monsoon because there is a different monsoon on the east coast and there is the west coast. But even then, the it's the monsoon isn't like you have in India or something. It's not like torrential downpour all day long kind of a thing. Um, but it's uh, definitely a, a monsoon season in Borneo though, and that's kind of October to January, and that's the full on wet season uh so when the rainforest gets very rainy so that's kind of best avoided but apart from that it's yeah as much yeah. as kind of anything goes 
Okay, fantastic. And also going during Ramadan is good fun uh, because people are really okay. excited about breaking their fast often with you. Uh, I've had some of the best <laughs> yeah. food experiences after the sunset and people have gone, right, quick, come, we must feast. That's a really good tip. Um, we, in terms of, by the way, before I ask a couple more questions from the audience, I just want to remind everyone at home that um, my colleague Angelique is posting a link to the survey where you can win one of those wonderful prizes that I mentioned earlier, including the £100 voucher to Mango Tree, which I um, wish I could nab one of those. Um, another question we have, and this is such a, such a broad question, what are the locals like? Oh, amazing. Yeah, I would actually love to get Matt's um, input and, and Ollie's having, you know, obviously both living there or lived there. That I just found, I mean, not only as we've said before, is their English phenomenal, but there's a real sense of sarcasm. And I have found in many places that I've been that yeah. people just find English sarcasm quite rude. And that is not the case um, that I have found in Malaysia. They they love a bit of sarcasm. And yeah, I was I was chuffed. I was cracking all the jokes. Yeah, I would really because <laughs> it usually doesn't translate that well, does it? When you go oh, to the, and, the country, yeah. I mean, Matt, what what are, what are your thoughts, sort of living there? Do you? Um, I, 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 I would agree to to a de I would agree to a degree. Um, uh, because the uh, I think sometimes you can be careful. I I know I pulled off a joke or two before, and I get this sort of nervous laugh. Um, you know, it's like. They, uh, they, they want, they know they should be laughing, but they're not sure what they're laughing at. Um, but, uh, but no, that I think in general, um, Malaysians as a whole have a, have a great sense of humor, but again, going back to this distinctly three different cultures in Malaysia, and they're very different, even though they're Malaysian, the Malay is, is a, is a very different culture than the Chinese and the, and the Indian and, and mm -hmm. those two are not alike either. And so it's, um, yeah, so you you really have to, um, I don't know, uh, experience all of them. It's mm. very safe, I would say, as well, just to kind of add to that, either whether you're a solo traveler or a yes. female traveler, I genuinely feel that the, you know, I've traveled a lot of places in Latin America, or in Africa, or all over the world uh, by myself, India. Uh, but definitely Malaysia, you, you know, I wouldn't think twice, I wouldn't hesitate about traveling there as a solo traveler. It's kind of really welcoming as everyone has kind of uh, has spoken to. Thanks, Laura, you've just, um, you just answered my next question. You're welcome. And um, one more, goodness me, I'm gonna squeeze this one in. Um, somebody at home has just messaged in and wants to know, are there any misconceptions about Malaysia? Um, Matt, Ollie. Shall well, I think anyone? Matt alluded to one, which is, I'll, I'll admit that I wasn't really sure of the difference between Malay and Malaysian uh, until I spent some time to think about it. And, you know, the Malays are a very proud people, and also the Malaysians are very proud people. A good approximation is you can, you know, a Welsh person can be proud to be Welsh and proud to be British and proud to be European. So these aren't identities which necessarily clash with each other. But what's nice is that no matter where you're from in Malaysia, no matter what cultural identity you have, there will always be a rivalry with Singapore. So if you ever want to quit, <laughs> me, you can say, oh, I, I tried this in Singapore, but your version's better. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yeah, and you know what? Yeah. Even more so is Penang in Singapore, because um, they say that there was three history says that there was like three cities that that uh, England was going to make as the sort of the main port city of, of the Straits of Malacca. And it was Penang, uh, Singapore and um, and Malacca and Singapore won out. And I think I think Penang and Malacca have had a chip on their shoulder ever since. So which <laughs> rightly so. I, I agree with it. <laughs> Excellent. Guys, I'm so sorry to say that I'm going to have to wrap it up now. Um, I had so many more questions, but maybe we'll just have to do another one of these. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you, uh, first of all, to our sponsors, Tourism Malaysia and Malaysia Airlines. To our wonderful panelists, I've, I feel like I could sit here and listen to your stories all night long. Um, and also to everyone at home for tuning in. Um, please do keep an eye out on our website, nationalgeographic.co.uk slash travel, where we'll be posting future Travel Geeks events, as well as um, our masterclasses and information about the festival. And like I said, thank you so much um, to everyone for being here. And I will see you at the next event. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>